Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. The study today is titled The Firmament and God's Throne. You know, as we've been studying and discussing the shape of the earth and whether the earth is moving and orbiting the sun, etc., it's really determined by the first chapter in Genesis, Creation Week. If the firmament is a solid structure spread over the earth with the sun, moon and stars placed within it, as the Bible says, then the earth must be stationary and it must be the sun which circles the earth. Therefore, understanding the firmament is crucial to our understanding of the earth and the sun, etc. For example, those that teach the globe is orbiting the sun. They either have to place the sun in a different second firmament or they have to teach that the firmament is simply just the sky, the air or the atmosphere in order to harmonise their heliocentric model. Those who teach so have to reject the plain passages of, of Scripture, how the firmament is described and also the very word itself, what it means. They also have to deny that there are any waters still above the firmament that they believe is just the atmosphere. They try to harmonise this by saying that the waters above are simply moisture in the clouds or vapour, mist, etc. However, when we go to Genesis chapter 1, verses 2, 6 and 7, we see that the firmament was made for a specific purpose. Genesis 1, 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Right at the very beginning of the creation, we see that the earth had no form or was void. It was just a mass of deep water. And verse 6. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and notice what the firmament was for? To divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. Notice how God made the firmament to divide deep waters, not just mist or vapour and moisture, etc., but deep waters. And that word, friends, waters in the Hebrew, it means exactly that. It means the waters, it means the seas, the springs, etc., and that firmament was made to divide the waters from the waters. The same waters that are beneath are the waters that are now held above. Just like Genesis 1.6 says, let the firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Therefore, whatever is below the, the firmament, which we can see, the vast oceans, etc., that's divided from the same waters which are above. If the Bible wanted us to believe it's just mist or moisture, for example, in Genesis 2 verse 6, it says, they went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And that, notice what that word, it means a fog or a mist or a vapour. Genesis would have used a word like this, but it doesn't. As I said, the word used for waters, it means waters. And that's what the firmament was dividing. How can one read Genesis 1.6, this verse, and still claim that the waters above is simply mist or moisture? You're not being honest with the scripture. We have to be honest and let the Bible speak to us. And it's plainly telling us that that firmament that God made was dividing the great waters of the deep. God did not make a firmament, friends, to hold up mist and vapour, but the great deep waters from verse 2. God had to make something solid. And this is what the meaning of the word is for firmament, rakia. From the Strong's, it means an expanse, i.e. the firmament, apparently a visible arch of the, of the sky, etc. From the lexicon, from the root word, Rakar, notice the, the meaning, extended surface, solid, firmament, flat as base or a support, vault of heaven supporting waters above. Considered by the Hebrews as a solid and supporting the waters which are above, which is exactly what we're reading in Genesis chapter 1, that divided the waters. And this is the, the root word that Rakia comes from, Rakar. And again, from the Strong's, it means something that you have to pound out, like pounding out the earth, by hammering, or to overlay with thin sheets of metal, to beat, to make broad, to spread abroad. Remember these words later as we look at something in Ezekiel. To spread out, to stretch, to stamp, to spread into, into plates, etc. And from the Bible commentary of Jameson, Fawcett and Brown, it says of the firmament, an expanse, a beating out as a plate of metal. So the meaning of this word and how it's used in Genesis gives the, gives the idea of something that God spread out and made, something that was firm and solid, 
something that would support the, the heavy waters above. And this is exactly what the meaning brings out and what the commentators even tell us is the meaning. You cannot stamp or stretch out something solid, friends, to overlay if it's just air. Air cannot hold up the heavy waters. This needed a solid base. This is why those who believe in a, skinning, in a spinning globe have to get away from the King James Version and the, and the meaning of the word firmament, something that is solid and firm. And as we've seen in previous studies, even when they translated the, the Septuagint from the Hebrew into the Greek, they used the word stereoma, which again means something in the Greek which is solid. And when they, in the Latin translation, they used the word firmamentum, from which the King James gets the word firmamentum. Every time the translators used this word, it was always something solid. Another argument that, that many use in order to support the spinning globe is to say, well, the, the waters are not there anymore, that they were dispersed after the flood. However, when we read the Psalm 148, King David praising the God of heaven and the heavens, he says, Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. The scripture tells us, friends, that the, those waters that were divided in Genesis chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, are still there today. David is praising the waters above, just as rightly as they were there from creation week. If we believe in a solid firmament over the earth, as the Bible says, then you cannot have infinite space with the sun and stars millions of miles away. This is why the firmament in Genesis 1 becomes such a crucial, so crucial to understand. The firmament is also described as a tabernacle, or a tent, or a curtain, or an arch, etc. For example, the 19th Psalm, talking about the heavens and the firmament, it says, verse 1 actually says that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament is handiwork. And in verse 4 it says, Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them has he set a tabernacle for the sun. Psalm 19.4, friends, is talking about that firmament that God made, and it tells us there that the sun was set within that tabernacle. Isaiah 40, verse 22 he did see that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretch about the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Again, the firmament is described as something that God spread out, described as a tent or as a tabernacle. What is the purpose for a tent or a tabernacle? Do you spread a tent over a spinning ball or over a plane? And when you're inside that tent or that tabernacle, what are you within? You're within an enclosure. Doesn't matter how big or small it is, you're within its bounds and you're protected from outside. This is the very meaning that God's bringing out with these passages. He spread it as a tabernacle, as a tent, a firmament over the earth. And we are in an enclosed system. This is where God could generate life, etc. Notice when we read Psalm 19, verses 1 and 4. A psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. And that's when it says, in, in them he have set a tabernacle for the sun. He's referring to that firmament, God's handiwork. The great work in creation that divided the waters, that allowed God to start create life. First thing he did was divide the waters with his firmament. And it says, in that firmament, friends, it says, he set a tabernacle for the sun. Not outside it, but inside it. And that is exactly what we saw in Genesis 1, when God made the firmament and divided the waters. Notice in Genesis 1, 17, 16 and 17, God made two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also, referring, of course, to the sun and the moon. And where did God set them? And God set them in the firmament of heaven to give light upon the earth. Exactly what Psalm 19, verse 4 says. So we see consistency right through the Bible, not just, not just in Genesis chapter 1. Same thing, it tells us that in the firmament he set, the, he set a tabernacle or a, an enclosure for the sun. When we put these passages together, this is the sort of picture we get. There you have the firmament, and above you have the waters, as David said in the 148th Psalm. And within that firmament you have earth, and you have the sun, moon, and stars. And this is why Genesis chapter 1 today cannot be accepted as it reads to those who believe in the spinning globe. Because as you look at that picture, it's impossible for that earth to be orbiting the sun, obviously. And therefore, they have to try and spiritualize or just reject totally what Genesis 1 is saying, literally. 
in order to hold to the model that many believe in today. But the scripture plainly teaches the firmament is solid, it separates the waters above from beneath, stretched out as a tent over the earth. The sun, moon and stars are within the firmament and not outside of it. Exactly like that is saying, and like the 19th Psalm says, he set a tabernacle for the sun. According to Genesis chapter 1 and numerous other passages, you cannot have the earth orbiting the sun, rather it is the sun that revolves around the earth, as we have seen in a previous study. Another point also is, coming back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 4, 6 and 7, take notice of these words, divide. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. In verse 6, referring to the firmament, he said, and let it divide the waters from the waters. In verse 7, God made the firmament and divided the waters, etc. Three times this word divide or divided is used. It's the same word, incidentally, every time. The word means to, it means to separate, to divide. But in verse 4, when God saw the light and it was good and God divided the light from darkness, did God have to make anything to divide the light from the darkness? They are intangible things. They are things that don't need something solid to separate them. God simply said, saw that light was good and divided the light from the darkness. However, when we get to verse 6 and 7, and it's talking about dividing the waters, what do we read? And God made the firmament and divided the waters which are under the firmament from the waters which are above. Even though it's the same word used, when we're reading about the waters that had to be divided that great deep, God now makes something solid, unlike the light and darkness. This again is inferring, teaching us that this was a solid structure that God made. And we'll see that as well a little bit more as we go along. You see, water, friends, is, is dense. It is very heavy. In fact, a thousand litres of water is equivalent to one tonne. Can you imagine those waters that the firmament had to divide, those deep, vast oceans? Trillions of tons of water. This is why God had to make the firmament, had to make it solid. This is why the 19th Psalm, verse 1, says that the firmament show off his handiwork. It was a wonderful engineering that God made with his hands to separate those waters. And that's why God inspired David to declare that those waters are still there above the heavens. And why the Genesis 1.7 says that God made that firmament. It's not, it's not poetic. It is not metaphorical. Genesis 1 is historical fact. Just as much as we believe literally that God made the sun, the moon, the stars, the trees, every green thing, the yield, herb, herb, herb yielding seed, the moving creature, and mankind, etc. All those things we believe God made. The sea creatures, the animals. So too, friends, in verse 7, he made a firmament and it was a solid structure and it's holding up oceans of waters, numerous weight of waters. The lexicon, as we saw, describes it as an arch. Some translations actually say a dome. The arch is a very simple design, yet it's very, it's very simple, yet a brilliant design, holding up so much weight. When we look at some of the ancient structures, especially the Roman aqueducts or the Colosseum and many of these old buildings, we see there are a series of archways. And they're designed in a way where the, the weight is evenly distributed over the entire arch. This is why it's such a simple design, but yet so, so strong. Anyone who knows anything about building understands the, how effective an arch can be. The firmament in Genesis chapter 1 is not just air or the atmosphere, it's a solid structure. As we saw from the lexicon, it's something that is beaten out or spread out over the earth. It's dividing the waters. It's housing the sun, the moon and the stars. And you cannot get out of it. Some try to teach there are two firmaments in Genesis chapter 1. But it's impossible to show that. I've asked people to try and show that to me, they cannot. But the reason they want to teach there's two firmaments is because they know if that sun, moon and stars are within the firmament that is spread over the earth, then the earth cannot be orbiting the sun. So therefore their model is destroyed and therefore they have to try and teach either the firmament is just an atmosphere that way you can harmonize the sun being millions of miles away or you teach it the second firmament altogether which genesis chapter one does not teach for example firmament in genesis one is mentioned nine times and it is always the same firmament there are not two firmaments in genesis one and because genesis one all 31 verses contain the entire creation of this heaven and earth if you're going to teach the firmament, this is where you need to show it, because the heavens and the earth were finished. 
and when God had finished his creation in those six days. But notice verse 16, Genesis 1. And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. There we see the creation of the sun, the moon and the stars. And what did God do? He's, and God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. So here we see that the sun has been placed within the firmament that is above the earth, that divided the waters. Which firmament is that? The same one as verse 14. Notice it's talking about the same subject. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the night, the day from the night. And so the firmament that in verse 17 that God placed the sun, moon and stars is the same firmament, of course, from verse 14. And what is the firmament from verse 14? None other than the firmament from verse 8. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And that firmament from verse 8, friends, is the same firmament that God made in verse 7. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters, etc. There were not two firmaments in Genesis 1. That firmament that the sun and moon and stars have been placed in is the same firmament that was made in verse 7, divided the waters, etc. We're going to look at another place now in the book of Ezekiel where the firmament is mentioned and how Ezekiel describes it. Ezekiel 1 and verse 22. This incidentally is the same word, Rakia, it's found in Genesis 1, speaking about the same firmament, not some other firmament. There is no where in the language, in the passage, anywhere which, which is seeking to describe a second or a different firmament. Notice what it says. And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature, this is Ezekiel in vision, the vision of heaven, and he's describing, notice the words, the likeness of the firmament. And it's above or upon the heads of the living creature, the cherubims. Notice what is, how he describes it. It was the color of terrible crystal. Notice the words, stretched forth over their heads above. Ezekiel describing the likeness of the firmament. And he, and he says it's like terrible crystal that is stretched forth. Sounds like something solid, definitely. And that's what we saw earlier with the word for firmament. It's something that's beaten out and stretched out, spread abroad. As he looked upon this firmament that was above the heads of the cherubims, he describes it as, as like an awesome or a wonderful crystal that was spread out or stretched out. Clearly something solid. Now notice what is on the other side of, the, of this firmament that Ezekiel is looking at. There's verse 22 again. Likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. Verse 25. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads where they stood and had let down their wings. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above it. We will see that this is referring to the throne of God. And notice where it is. Ezekiel really wants you to understand something here. It says that the firmament is above the heads of the cherubim, stretched forth over their heads, above their heads. Verse 25. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads. So this voice is on the other side. Verse 26. And above the firmament and over their heads, there was a likeness of a throne. And the likeness is the appearance of a man above upon it. So this throne of God that is above the firmament says four times there. And who was sitting on it? None other than the Lord. The likeness is the appearance of a man that was upon it, verse 26 and verse 28. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. So Ezekiel is privileged to be taken off into vision, the vision of heaven, the glory of heaven. He sees this wonderful, awesome, terrible firmament like crystal that is stretched out. The cherubim are, are underneath it and above it, above the, on the other side of the firmament is a throne and the glory of the Lord upon that throne. Ezekiel sees God sitting on his throne above the firmament and under his feet he describes this firmament as something terrible, crystal, stretched forth. Now notice how Moses, he has a very similar vision Similar vision. And notice how he describes what is under God's feet. This is when Moses and the 70 elders were taken up with Aaron and, and Nadab and Abihu up onto Mount Sinai. And they were given this vision as well. Very similar to Ezekiel's. And they saw the God of Israel. 
And notice what was under his feet. And Ezekiel told us there was a, a firmament like crystal stretched out. And Moses sees the God of Israel as well. And what does he see under his feet? As it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone. And as it were, the body of heaven in its clearness. Ezekiel and Moses both envision and describing the firmament under God's throne. Ezekiel describes it as a likeness of terrible crystal. Moses here as a paved work. Both describing something solid. That very word work there, describing the firmament, that's what it means. A paved work. That word work, it means an action, an activity, a product, a property, something that God wrought, something he made, which is what we saw in Genesis 1-7, and God made the firmament to divide the waters. These prophets in vision are seeing the same thing with God's throne above. And they're describing it as something solid, something that was created, that was made. And that's why Psalm 19.1 says that the firmament is show of God's handiwork. That word handiwork in Psalm 19, verse 1, incidentally, is the same word you're reading here in Exodus 24.10, a paved work. It's the same word, same number in the Strong's. That is what the word paved means now. They saw the God of Israel that was under his feet as it were a paved work of a sapphire stone, as it was the heaven in its clearness. That word paved, it means whiteness, transparency. This firmament, Ezekiel described it as like crystal. Crystal, we, we often use the term clear as crystal. Moses is describing it as something that was made and solid, but also as something that was transparent and white and like sapphire. Look at Young's literal, how it describes it, exactly how it is in the Hebrew. And they see the God of Israel, and under his feet is as the white work of the sapphire, like the purity of the heavens. And Moses described it as a paved work of a sapphire, as the body of heaven in its clearness. They're both describing this great creation of God with his throne above. It's clearly something solid. It's clearly something that's very awesome. Ezekiel sees it as crystal, terrible crystal stretched out. Moses sees it as sapphire that's been stretched out and clear, clear like the heavens. You know, friends, that there are white sapphires and they are clear, and that the sapphire itself is a crystal. Notice this. White sapphires are completely colorless sapphires. A sapphire receives its color from the trace elements present within the earth when the crystal is forming. White sapphires are quite rare. They are completely untouched by the trace elements. So when Ezekiel describes this firmament as terrible crystal and Moses as a paved, clear sapphire work, and we saw that firmament means something solid, something strong, something that's supporting the waters above, how strong is a sapphire? That these, I'm not saying the firmament is a sapphire, but I'm saying how the prophets are describing it. How strong is a sapphire? This is something that's called the Mohs scale. And what it is is a scale that ranks the hardest minerals on earth and scale from one to ten and the sapphire comes from the family called the corundum i'm familiar with this word because if you work with stone or with granite you use corundum stones to polish granite now we know how hard granite is granite is one of the hardest surfaces on earth granite on this on this most scale is around the seven iron which is very strong is around four look where sapphire is the only crystal harder than corundum, which is sapphire, is a diamond. Ranked 1 to 10, with diamonds being the hardest mineral at 10, sapphires are ranked just below at a 9 on the scale. The only known mineral on this earth that can scratch a sapphire is a diamond. It is one of the hardest natural minerals on earth. Much harder than granite, much harder than iron, etc. Much harder. Very, very strong. Not only that, but the sapphire can be shaped. Not only strong, but it can be shaped. It is very adaptable. It can shape to be as thin as glass. They make expensive watch glasses with sapphire glass. They use it for making security windows, for body armor. It has a melting temperature of over 2,000 degrees. It's incredibly strong, incredibly insulating, very hard, and yet very adaptable, and easily stretched out or formed. Very interesting when we look at the firmament, how it's spread abroad and how strong and yet how transparent it is. Now it's described like crystal. 
These two prophets envisioned they saw God on his throne. Under his feet they saw the likeness of the firmament. Ezekiel describes it as terrible crystal that was stretched forth or spread out. And Moses describes it as, as a paved or a, a white, clear sapphire stone in all its clearness. Both are describing the same thing. Ezekiel calls it a firmament stretched forth like crystal. Moses describes it as clear sapphire stone. What does crystal look like? Of course, it looks like glass. In fact, crystal can be blown to be thinner than glass, and that's where you have crystal glassware, etc. And remember what Elihu declared to Job? Speaking about the, the, the creation of the firmament, look, notice, notice the words he used. Has thou with him, has thou with God spread out the sky, which is strong, and as a molten looking glass? Even Elihu describes this firmament, this great wonder of God, like a molten looking glass, which is strong. Ezekiel, like a terrible stretch forth crystal, and Moses as a, as a clear sapphire stone of paved work. Now, whatever the composition of the firmament is, but I can't tell you for certain what it is. I don't think anyone can, but one thing is certain. God made it, and it is solid. It is transparent. It is very strong. He stretched it out. He spread it out. And this is the Bible saying this. It holds up the waters. It looks like crystal or like glass. It is spread over the earth. And he placed the sun, the moon, and the stars inside that molten looking glass, inside that firmament. Remember, friends, this firmament is what divided the waters, and those waters are still there. And God's throne is still there above those waters. That's why the Bible says this. Look how these verses just come to life when you see this beautiful truth, and how much more meaning now these verses have, and why God inspired the writers to write these things. Psalm 29:10, the Lord sitteth upon the flood. We saw that his throne is above the firmament, and that firmament is holding up the waters. Psalm 104, verse 3, speaking about God and his, his abode, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters. Look how Albert Barnes comments on this Psalm 104, verse 3. It takes you right back to creation. It refers here to the chamber. Notice what he refers to, the chamber, where it says he layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters. It refers to the exalted abode of God, as if raised above all other edifices or above the world. The word waters here refers to the description of the creation in Genesis 1, 6 and 7. The waters above the firmament and the waters below the firmament. The allusion here is to the waters above the firmament and the meaning is that God had constructed the place of his own abode, the room where he dwelt in those waters. That is, in the most exalted place in the universe. It does not mean that he made it of the waters, but that his home, his dwelling place, was in or above those waters, as if he had built his dwelling not on solid earth or rock, but in the waters, giving stability to that which seems to have no stability, and making the very waters a foundation for the structure of his abode. That's what Psalm 104 verse 3 is saying. And that's how Albert Barnes commentates upon it. Once again, we see that the waters are still there. It means the firmament is still there and God's throne is above it. Moses described it as clear sapphire work and Ezekiel as the likeness of crystal. Notice how John in the Revelation, a similar vision, how he describes it. And before the throne was a sea of glass, like unto crystal. It seems to me that Ezekiel and John were seeing something very similar here. They both described it the same words. The firmament like unto terrible crystal spread out. And John describes before the God's throne a sea of glass, glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and around about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes, and before, the, before and behind. And there we have Ezekiel on the right. And the likeness of the firmament, the terrible crystal stretched forth over the heads above. And notice what else, friends. Notice who else one day will stand upon that sea of glass if we are faithful. Again, John in vision, he saw not only that sea of glass before God's throne, but notice who else he saw standing there. And as I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And then that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the halves of God. That firmament we see all the way back in Genesis chapter 1, that divided the waters above from the waters beneath. 
that God placed the sun, moon and stars within it to give life upon the earth. Moses in vision sees it on Mount Sinai with the 70 elders, describes it as a clear sapphire stone. Ezekiel describes it as terrible crystal stretched forth and John describes it as a sea of glass like unto crystal. And then at the end he sees the saints, those who have received the victory over the beast in his image or gotten the victory, standing on that same sea of glass on the side of God's throne, having the harps of God. What I like about this verse also is when Ezekiel describes it as as a sea of glass, like on, like as sorry, as a terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads, we see all the way through the, the Bible, the study of the firmament, it's all, it's something that's dividing, not only the waters, but dividing heaven from earth as well. God's throne is above it; He's looking down upon the children of men, etc. But the beautiful thing about Revelation four six is that there's no more division. Now God's people are standing with him. The firmament no longer dividing God from his people, but now they've, they've gotten the victory over the beast in his image and they're standing with, by the throne of God. Jesus said in, in, in Revelation 3.21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit on my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down upon my father's throne. Christ passed through that firmament, came to live on earth as a man, the same nature as us. He overcame in that nature and he took humanity back to heaven sit upon his father's throne. And here we see the saints standing by the throne of God as well upon that sea of glass. They follow their saviour and there's no more division now between them and God. Loving Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, once again, we want to thank thee for this study. We want to thank thee for passages that we've read in the past and we never saw the importance or the lessons they really contained for us. And uh, we're sorry that sometimes we read these things a little too um, metaphorical or too poetic when there's really a wonderful meaning behind them. When, when David says, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord and the firmament show of his handiwork, it means exactly what it says. When Elihu says to Job, where was thou? When he stretched forth the heavens as a molten looking glass. And when Ezekiel describes it as terrible crystal stretched forth or Moses as a sapphire stone of clearness, describing the wonders of your creation. The very first thing thou did after bringing, after saying, let there be light, you created this firmament, divided the waters, and then you're able to create everything that has life within itself. And to this day, is this firmament that gives life to this earth, that protects this earth, like a tabernacle for the sun to dwell in. And with this beautiful truth, we not only see the true creation story coming back and true faith in thy word, and also the errors that have been taught for so long. But we also see how close thou art to every one of us, how thou art looking down the eyelids try the children of men, and how you are much closer to us than so-called science would have us believe today. So we thank you for these studies. We pray thou continue to guide us and teach us through thy word, and that many will come to this knowledge and to a greater appreciation of your love for us, your protection for us, and how close you are to each one of us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.